Let me read the scripture for you. I'm going to read this whole section, 10 through 18, but I'm only going to talk to you about a little piece of it. We're going to break it up. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of, of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. There's that prayer component again. All right, thank you. you may be seated. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Very interesting requirement. But it suggests that there is power available to us that isn't ours automatically. Do you ever get tired? Anybody? Okay, turn the lights back on for me. Do you, when you feel like you're in a fight, do you feel like you need the Lord? Okay. Will you feel like you need him more if life becomes difficult? Yeah. We understand that. That's why we're here. How many of you listen to the news and you follow the, what they say about the Dow and the economy and that makes you just a little bit nervous? I'm not, I'm not saying you're full of anxiety about it, but how many of you, like me, hear that stuff and you wonder, is everything going to be all right or are things going to get difficult? Anybody besides me? Sure. Well, the offer that is here is strength beyond what you naturally have. How about that? Would you like that? I would too. There have been times in my life I've needed strength beyond what I had. I remember I was in sixth grade and I was extremely clumsy. And um, I got picked on a lot. And I did not respond well to being picked on. But the only weapon I had was this. Now we had three taverns in the family, okay? So I knew very colorful combinations of words. And at times when I was under duress, I would use those words as vigorously as I could. And one day we were in gym and somebody who I will not name, who is not here, but I still will not name, uh, was being unfair to me. And I decided that I had had enough and I spoke to him in a very vigorous and colorful manner. And his response to that was to start beating me. He was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He was faster than me. He just started beating on me. And he wasn't going to quit, it didn't seem like. And I was suffering. And uh, I also refused to refrain and be silent. So the more he hit me, the more I hollered. And the more I hollered, the more he hit me. Then when I really wondered what in the world was going to happen, somebody larger and stronger than me grabbed me, picked me up one-handed, 
was the janitor, Nelson Hill. He was a retired farmer, strong as a bull, picked me up and carried me out. He was a friend of the family. Unbeknownst to me, he used to report to my mother every time I was in the hall. which was probably very hard on the phone lines. But I was so relieved to know that there was help available to me that was not my own power because I was helpless in the face of the onslaught. And my words, as creative and colorful as they were, did not help me. And often we learn habits and practices that do not help us in a crisis, and yet we cling to them when what we need is power that is greater than our own. Do any of you have an heirloom or an antique that you treasure? Anybody? What do you have? Oh, your hand's not up? Sorry, I thought your hand was up. Yeah, it's a hairpin from my mother that she used to put up her mom. Okay. All right. That's interesting. I have no hair-related mementos. Yep. Mr. G. Leather-covered chair. Okay. Anybody else? Sue? Okay. Mary? Say again. Okay. Anybody else? Kathy? Cool. I saw another hand back there. Sherry? Okay. So having these things touches us. How would you like to be able to swing Babe Ruth's bat? How would you like to write with one of Dolly Madison's pens or hold Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? We go to museums and such, don't we? What does that do for us? Not trying to trick you. Why do we do that? Why do we like those things that are old and, and aren't the person but... What? Okay, learn from the past. What else? Creates connection. Creates connection. That's right. Things help us create a connection. I'm really not much of a collector, um, but I have a pocket watch that does not work. That was my Norwegian grandfather's. He was a character. He was funny. And he was always joking about something. Grandpa's parents were from Norway, and, and for some reason there seemed to be animosity between the Norwegians and the Swedes. And he was always making jokes about that. And he used to, used to tell me when he'd see a Swede, he'd say, now, Jeff, there's a Swede. Be careful. And then he'd say, but don't worry. Swedes aren't so tough. Me and my seven brothers, we could beat up a Swede. <laughs> and on and on he would go. Well, I didn't retain his animosity toward the Swedes, thankfully, but uh, I do relish the memories. And I have his stopwatch, and I have his bowling bag, and a few other things that were his. And they helped me feel connected. To feel connected is a normal human need. I don't think you need to feel sheepish about that. I don't think that's a problem unless you're just obsessed in an unnatural way over something. But to want to have a connection with someone who is no longer here is a normal and precious thing. I believe God values it. Now, I want you to think about this verse because this is an important question. We're asked to put on armor. Whose armor 
are we asked to put on? God's. Put on the whole armor of God. Okay? Now, it's interesting to me, it doesn't say put on some armor. It doesn't say put on spiritual armor. It says put on God's armor. And the reason you need to put on God's armor is so you may be able to stand against the tricks or the wiles of the devil. So the implication is that if you don't put on the armor, how will you do in relation to the devil? You lose, okay? He's tricky. He's been doing it for a long time. He knows how to get me and he knows how to get you. So we're asked to put on God's armor. This is what God brings into a spiritual battle. Now we often have these illustrations where we kind of humanize God and make things easy to understand. God doesn't put on a suit, okay? God doesn't put on a physical helmet. God doesn't carry a physical sword. Uh, but God puts these things on in order to beat the devil. And so we're encouraged to put on God's armor. Clearly it's for protection in the battle. But it also may be to help us feel connected. How many of you would like to feel a greater connection to God? Not saying you don't feel connected, I'd just like to feel more, okay? So these pieces of the armor that we're talking about, they're there to help us, protect us. There's an offensive weapon. And I believe they help us feel connection to God. Now, this is a very real spiritual battle. And again, it's repeated, to take unto you the whole armor of God. Don't be content with just pieces. Take the whole thing. Now, if the battle isn't fought, and I mean this sincerely, if the battle is not fought, the losses we experience are beyond our ability to comprehend. Everybody says, oh, I just want to go to heaven and then everything will be fine. That shows a misunderstanding of what God says to us and what God offers us. God wants us to fight the battle because the victors in battle get the spoils of the battle. And those who sit on the sidelines and do nothing or those who surrender to the enemy get nothing. Or at least they get less. You see, if we fight the battle the reward that God will give us is greater than we can imagine and it's greater than any plunder gained in any human battle throughout human history. This last week, there's a, there's a story about a treasure train of Hitler's. Oh boy, wouldn't you like to find that buried in your backyard? All the stuff that crook stole. Well, the Bolsheviks, they ransacked Russia. Tremendous amount of wealth taken on fairly and dishonestly. Remember Imelda Marcos in the Philippines? Shoes, right. Amazing stash of shoes. You know what? It will pale in comparison to the reward God gives for the simplest things we do for him. This serving him is not a trivial thing. This being in the battle for him is not a small thing. This being in the battle for him and winning the battle for him is something we will be grateful in eternity forever that we did. Our calling is to stand. Our calling is to not crumble not go with the flow, not be like everybody else. I'm sure our children got tired of us saying, they'd say to us, well, everybody else gets to do it. And after I got done saying, everybody? What about this one? What about that one? Well, not everybody. And then I'd say, remember, we're not trying to be like everybody else. We're trying to be excellent. I want you to have the best future, not just some future. And here's the verse where I want to focus for the last part of this. 
Stand therefore, this is the first thing you put on, having your loins girt about with truth. Now we value truth and truthfulness, don't we? And we tend to think in terms, we tend to think of truth in terms of honesty and how we deal with others. If we're honest with others, then we're truthful. But that is not God's first focus when you talk about truth. God's first focus when you talk about truth is what is going on inside. What is the internal dialogue that's going on inside? Am I telling myself the truth? People say, of course, pastor, I'm telling myself the truth. Oh, that's not true in so many cases. In fact, just about any time somebody comes for counseling of any sort, this is what we do. We take the story, we take what they believe, we take how it drives them, and then we strip away the things that are lies from the things that are true. And usually we come out with, yeah, you do have a significant problem. We can work on that problem, but first let's get rid of all the things that aren't real that you've added, like my life is over, nobody cares about me, there's no hope, nothing can change, there's no purpose to this. It is amazing how we have learned to tell ourselves lies that play like a recording in our heads, and then we do things to support those notions. Now the girdle was part of the armor. It was actually a big piece some of your translations translate it belt. It's unlikely that that's what's referenced here because in old times, the girdle would cover a person from below the breastplate, take my word for it, part way down the thighs. It was to protect vital organs. It was to make it difficult for someone to cause you to bleed profusely should you be stabbed. The other part of the girdle's purpose was other pieces of the armor would attach to it. It would give stability to the breastplate. It would give stability to whatever there was to protect the legs. It would help you move in battle. I'm the wrong one to illustrate moving in battle with ease, but it would help you move in battle with ease so you were not clumsier than you had to be and you were protected. That was the purpose of the girdle. You wrapped yourself in it first so everything else could be added so you were protected. Now, truth is very protective. In the foundation of productive dealings in a society, truth protects people. Proverbs makes the point that a just weight and balance are the Lord's and all the weights of the bag are his work. It's God's idea that we are truthful. It's God's idea that we're truthful even in our dealings with each other. It's part of what he established for an orderly society. And even when you go farther back into the um, civil law of the Old Testament, you see that um, God was planning. Leviticus 19.36 says, just balances and just weights, a just bushel and a just liquid measure. I took out the old terms that we wouldn't relate to shall ye have, I am the Lord. He said, look, this is simple. You've got to deal honestly in all things. It's how order comes to life. Truth protects the conscience. We just talked at Bible study about the fact that the conscience is something that can be damaged. The conscience needs to be nurtured and protected and strengthened because the conscience is not a perfect thing. The conscience is something that develops over time. 
And the conscience can only respond to the information that it has. It doesn't necessarily tell you the right thing to do. When the conscience is damaged because it's ignored or violated, a door is opened which may allow all types of evil. So the truth is vital. It's important to your own protection, like the girdle was vital to the life and safety of the warrior. Now, every person should be more concerned about keeping a healthy conscience than defending what does not offend their conscience. One of the worst things people say, and I hope you never say it, is, well, my conscience is clear. Well, how many of you ever seen people do bad things and tell you their conscience was clear? Sure. I bet if you think about it, more of you have. Because your conscience isn't a certain thing. Truth is protective of all that we are personally. It's protective of our state of mind. It's protective of our ambition. It's protective of our ability to accomplish. Now you see this in the interaction with Satan, Eve and Satan. Kathy, are you up to helping me with an illustration? Come on up. I'm not going to embarrass you. Don't worry. Come on up here. Just face me over here. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Kathy's going to be Eve. Who do you think I am? I know, this is great casting so far. Serpent came to Eve and said, uh, you, did God really say you can't eat of every tree of the garden? God's trying to engage her in a conversation she should not have. And so she accepts that idea that she should be in this conversation she should not have, and she said, well, we may eat. It's okay. We can eat. But the fruit, which is in the middle of the garden, that we can't eat. Was that true? God told them they couldn't eat that fruit. Was that true, that there was a forbidden fruit? Okay. And then she said, we can't touch it or we'll die. Was that true? No. They could have played hockey with that fruit. They could have made house ornaments with that fruit. They could have thrown at each other for spite or sport, and that wouldn't have been a violation. But they had one rule. <clears throat> what was the rule? Don't eat the fruit. So when Satan starts to get her to question the goodness of God, He gives her a burden. Hold your arms out like this. He gives her a burden. Is it real? What? Yep, that burden's real. It's a real restriction. A couple weeks ago on a Friday, I had a colonoscopy and an endoscopy. They told me, you can't eat. You know, a lot of times I come here and don't eat all day. It doesn't bother me. Can't wait to get home. I'll eat then. But the day you tell me I can't have any food, you know what? I just want to eat all day long. So here's Eve. She's got this one restriction, and Satan questioning her and casting aspersions on God makes that a little heavier. But then she says, we can't even touch it. So here's what she's done. And this is what all of us do when we add the false to what is true. Is that heavier? Yeah. Can you hold it just as long? Uh, probably not. No. Because we've added to what's true and what's a real problem that can be dealt with, and we've added things that can't be dealt with because they're not true. Thank you. Now, I want us to be the most honest people in town. 
I want us to have the most honorable business dealings. I want people to look at us and go, those people at the Big Red Church, those are honest people. But what I want God to know is that we're learning to be honest with ourselves. Because it's in that honesty that the battle is won. People believe all sorts of things that are not true. I'm just amazed at the mean stuff husbands and wives say to each other on Facebook. Oh, let's see. Can I say this? Probably not with this age group in the room. But people expect to say hurtful things and have there be no backlash. Is that a reasonable expectation? Is that a biblical expectation? No. And yet person after person believes that. You know, we're we're watching the economy like you are. Our first decision when we see unsettling things is cut some spending. It's our first decision. Usually that means less going out to eat. I hate that idea. (laughs) I like going out to eat. But you know what? I don't buy the lie that you can just spend without consequences. This isn't about them today. This is about us. And not to pick on you, but that's part of the problem. It's easy to point out somebody else's violation. It's hard to be honest about our own. And yet what God wants us to have as the primary thing, the first thing to help us win this battle against evil is a strong understanding of what's true. That means we have to learn his truth. That means the Bible studies and the movies and the, and the time together has value above what the average person understands. Because if we do not have truth, we will build our lives and our attitudes and our expectations on lies. Is that likely to work well for us? No. So, the serpent said to her, you will not surely die. Was he right? No, he wasn't right. Because spiritually she died. Spiritually and physically she went from being endless in her life expectation to limited in that expectation. Instead of having a perfect creation, now all of creation right down to the weeds growing out of the ground was marred. He lied, she had the truth, She didn't listen to the truth. Satan tested her battle armor. And how did she do? She lost. Because she forgot the most fundamental thing. And and I'm going to say to you, if you ever move from this place and you need to find a church and your criteria is, oh, I want the best activities and the best music and all that stuff, you better make sure that you found a preacher that will preach to you the truth in a balanced way. Because that's the only kind of place you should go to church. Because your life will not be determined by the experiences you have. Your life will be determined by the truth you live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to engage this battle. Help us to learn your ways and follow your path and take our Christian lives as seriously as if we were under attack. Amen.